This is Worship God, a podcast of the Gospel Coalition Canada. Worship God is designed to equip worshipers and worship leaders for Christ-centered worship. Well, hey, everyone. Welcome back to Worship God. My name is Rob Brockman. I'm one of the associate pastors at Cornerstone Baptist Church in Orillia, Ontario. And today I am joined by one of my co-hosts, uh, Dr. Johnny Markin, who is the worship director at Cloverdale Baptist Church in Surrey, BC, and the director of worship of the Worship Leader Institute. Johnny, welcome back to the podcast, brother. Thanks, Rob. Good to be back. And today we're very excited to welcome with us Dr. Michael Haken. Dr. Haken is professor of church history at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, the director of the Andrew Fuller Center for Baptist Studies, and is also professor of church history at Heritage Theological Seminary in Cambridge, Ontario. Dr. Haken, thank you so much for joining us today on the podcast. Yeah, it's great. Good to be with you. Thank you. Well, as you can tell by the title today, um, today we wanted to dive into the subject of the history of worship in the early church. Uh, Dr. Haken has been one of my profs at Heritage Seminary in Cambridge, Ontario, where I am slowly but surely uh, plugging away at my MDiv. Um, and actually a couple years ago, I was in church history part one, and we spent uh, much of that course looking at the patristic era or the early church fathers. Um, so by the patristic era, early patristic era, I'm talking about the post apostolic era. This era is an era of off and on persecution of political intrigue of theological development and debate as the church was in its infancy. And I, I find this a fascinating, fascinating era, era to study because you have the legacy of the apostles being carried down by guys like Polycarp or Clement of Rome or Ignatius of Antioch. And, and there's literally only a few generations separating the influence of the apostles, John, Peter, and Paul. So, so for me, studying the church as it begins to develop in this era provides some interesting insight into the roots and the heritage of the Christian church. And it provides us some insight when it comes to the subject of worship. So, so Michael, you, you have gained notoriety as an expert in the subject of the patristics. I'm just curious from your perspective, why have you spent so much time studying this era? Why do you think it's important to study and reflect upon the early church? Yeah. I mean, uh, for me, uh, I've always loved history. And the history that I was first uh, drawn to very much was the ancient uh, world, uh, Greco-Roman. Um, you know, one of the earliest books that I read was a child's version of the Iliad, for example. Mm. And so um, it's not surprising that when after my conversion, I began to realize my call to be a historian, that that would be the era that I would be drawn to. Uh, obviously, since then, um, I've come to see that the early the early church, the patristic period, is, as we describe it, which runs, uh, I would probably date it a bit later. Yeah. I'd probably take it all the way up to the advent of Islam in the 600s, mm -hmm. which radically reshapes the configuration, geographical configuration of the early church. Um, it takes out uh, a lot of the Middle East and North Africa so that the early church then becomes very much a European thing mm. um it had spread uh to asia and uh south of uh egypt into uh what we now describe as sudan ethiopia mm. but the the idea that Euro christianity is a european thing really uh, starts to occur after the advent of islam to some degree mm. um so uh i've come to see that period uh in, in one way as the reformers did uh, the reformers, in their seeking to reform theology and worship, uh, didn't simply reject the entirety of church history. They felt that the medieval period had taken a number of wrong turns, uh, particularly in worship. Um, in the Carolingian era, which is around the seven eight hundreds, a number of steps were taken that produced a model of worship that was very different from the early church. And so the, for me, 
the study of the patristic period or that ancient church or early church or whatever uh, you describe it as um, is really kind of looking at our history the way the reformers did. Um, not trying to jump back uh, literally to the apostolic era, but recognizing that you, we have this uh, you know, development in time and that the patristic period is very helpful because it, it, it brings to the fore some elements that are there in solution, as it were, in Scripture. So, for example, the doctrine of the Trinity um, is there very much a biblical doctrine, but it's hammered out in the patristic period. The canon, you know, um, yeah. one of the reasons why we, we need to know this period is that the early church is what uh, recognizes that God's hand is upon the uh, 27 books that we call the New Testament. Um, the apostolic period doesn't close with, you know, um, a table of contents <laughs> that we have in the front of our Bibles. Uh, that takes you know, a period of time up until the fifth century to determine that, yeah, these are the books that God has inspired and therefore are canonical alongside uh, the Old Testament. So that early period then is is, is vital. Um, uh, a number of other things also come out. This, this won't necessarily occupy us today, um, is uh, in the West, all of us are Augustinians. If, if we've been raised in the West, Protestant, Catholic, doesn't matter what you are. Uh, Augustine is so influential upon the development of Western Christianity. And it, therefore, it's helpful uh, to understand Augustine uh, as well as others who preceded him. Hmm. You know, it's it's. I never thought about it before, but when you talked about the ref the reformers, right? They were reforming around the subject of worship. That was that was at least a large part of it. Often we think that it's like, oh, it's just kind of this theology, but it was really had to center around worship and worship in the church. Johnny, as as worship leaders, why do you think it's important for us to then reflect on the early church? Why that why that might why might that be helpful for us as people who lead worship today? Well, that's the very question a lot of my history of worship students were asking at the university. <laughs> Can't we just study the history of Hillsong? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's, it, you know, there is so much that we can glean in the early period that that has a lot of a mirror image to where we are at today. I think for one, the organic nature of that pre-Constantinian period, before it went into a lot of heavy regalia and in big structures and, and the need for the governmental structures within church, you know, we see a much more organic kind of church gathering. And so we want to be able to look at ourselves in, in the kind of informalistic culture that many of us have in evangelicalism and say, well, is it more than just adapting some of those early structures, you know, or is, is there something about how they put those things together and how they operated in their practice that we can glean from? And there are, you know, similarities to certain aspects of persecution or the, the sort of displacement of Christianity in culture that we can learn and glean from. And I think by looking at that, we might be able to just see a model of something. And it's also closer to the original time of the gospel. Uh, of, of the time of Christ and, and the writing of the New Testament. And so we're saying, well, they're looking at that and maybe there's a reason why they've got their stuff in the liturgy or the things that they're doing to practice. And what are the legacies that we have now? I spent a lot of my uh, uh, postgraduate studies looking at the ancient future movement and uh, you know, seeing how the two worlds can be brought together. And then I, I've been, I've been a history geek forever, and so this, this conversation is, is wonderful to be part of. Yeah. One thing that really interests me and perhaps will really interest our listeners is what did worship, what did a worship service look like? And I know that's hard as we look back through the you know, the corridors of history, 2000 years, uh, we probably don't have um, leftover you know, as many resources as we would like. But, and Michael, maybe I'll start with you. What do we have leftover, like ancient liturgies? Could, could you paint a picture uh, as best as you could of maybe what an ancient worship service maybe looked like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do have uh, liturgies, um, but they date from uh, uh, the the actual formal liturgies that we have date from um, 
the uh, fourth century, so right after Constantine's come to power. So I'm thinking of the liturgy of uh, uh, Serapion, uh, Saint Serapion, uh, who was a um, a bishop in uh, the Nile Delta. Um, but we do have a picture of uh, early. We have pictures of early Christian worship. Um, just a martyr. That is early Christian worship prior to that. Uh, just a martyr in the uh, second century in his apology uh, describes what worship looked like. And um, he talks about how the uh, scriptures would be read as, as much as we can. Um, so you've got this picture of people gathering. It's house churches. So it's not until you get to the uh, fourth century that you get large gatherings uh, because Christianity is uh, illegal technically and so uh, people would gather in house churches um, some of these house churches uh, might have a room dedicated for worship uh, we see evidence of that archaeologically by the fourth century um, but uh, most likely it's in what we what the romans would describe uh, and the greeks as the atrium which is the kind of central courtyard where you come into a, a roman house um, let me back up one little bit. Uh, the very fact that you have house churches where there would be worship taking place uh, demands there be within the congregation a number of people who are economically uh, well off, right. um, middle class uh, at a minimum. So, for instance, when Paul describes Aquila and Priscilla in uh, Romans and uh, Second Timothy and First Corinthians, having a church in their house— um, there have been a number of studies which are well-founded um, that would estimate that, you know, here's a couple that probably are middle, middle class, upper middle class. They have a house that maybe is, you know, maybe 3,000 square feet, something like that, 2,500 square feet, with a significant atrium that could hold 30, 40, 50 people. Mm -hmm. uh, the atrium is this courtyard you come into uh, when you step into a Roman house from the road. There'd be this large courtyard, and then around the courtyard, surrounding it on all four uh, walls, as it were, or all four sides, uh, would be the rooms of the home. Um, <clears throat> probably the most graphic illustration that I re think of is the, is the house of uh, Judah Ben Hur in Ben Hur. That's exactly. In, uh, uh, that, that, that's probably somewhat large, mm. uh, but that comes to mind in that movie. Um, so you, you've got, you've got maybe 30, 40 p p people. Um, it's, it's a house. So you've got servants, you've got children. And this is one of the reasons why I think you have what we call the household tables, uh, in Ephesians, Colossians, um, uh, uh, Titus, uh, first Peter, you know, how should, uh, parents interact with children, vice versa. Uh, slaves of masters, wives of husbands, because the, the, the house is so central and the family is so central to the early Christian movement. Um, they would gather for a fairly lengthy period of time, uh, much lengthier than our normal hour to an hour and a half. Um, Justin Martyr talks about them reading large for lack of a better word, gobs of scripture. Mm. Uh, this again reflects the fact that virtually nobody in that congregation has a Bible. They don't have scriptures. Uh, first of all, they can't afford them uh, for most people. Um, the average copy of, uh, say, the, the entire New Testament, once the canon is hammered out, is probably going to cost you about two or three years, uh, two or three, your, your, uh, annual salary for two or three years. Wow. I think about that. I mean, so nobody probably within our hearing has spent anywhere between, you know, uh, 80 to 90,000 to buy a New Testament. Right. But that's what you're looking at financially. And then uh, only 10% of people can read. And so you've got you, you if you're going to if you if you're to provide uh, an, a, a, a biblical education or a biblical um, maturation of these early disciples, these early Christians, you, you need to have these oral the oral recitation of large parts of Scripture. And out of this, um, but this also goes back to the synagogue. Out of this would 
come the the uh, the reading of the scriptures in a set order over the year. So you have um, a lectionary. Um, so the, that that's a central part. Uh, Justin Martyr talks about the um, the explaining of the word. So there's preaching, um, and then obviously the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lord's Supper was done only with baptized believers. Um, I'm not saying that because I'm a Baptist, but that's what, <laughs> that's what Justin Martyr indicates, that um, there would be at a certain point um, after the, the, the kind of the word part of the service, there would be um, a asking those who are uh, not baptized as believers and those who are not believers to leave. Mm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would then would be the celebration of the table. And he describes the celebration of the table. He has prayers. I think one of the things that is very different from our worship service and the uh, your typical evangelical worship service, say, in Ontario from or Canada or North America from the early church um, is the lack of written prayers. And written prayers are part of the early worship service. They come out of the synagogue worship. Um, etc. And then also the, 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 the failure, you know, our churches, we, we tend to be, we, we claim to be people of the book, but it's interesting that in a more uh, mainstream um, church like an Anglican church or a Catholic church or an Orthodox church, you'll hear more scripture read hmm. than you probably would in our churches. And uh, in that sense, we're, we're, we're not true to the uh, post-apostolic era, the patristic period, where large amounts of scripture were read, the use of written prayers, etc. So the service was really kind of two segments. One is the, 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 the hearing of the word, and then the, the response to that on the part of the believers in, in, the, in, the, in the table. Huh. Johnny, is there, are there other examples that you can think of? Yeah, I think we get some early indication of some of the elements of what's going on in gathered worship. Acts 2.42, very early on, and we were seeing that there is the teaching of the apostles, there is the uh, prayers, there is the breaking of bread, and there is done the context of fellowship. So there's these four elements that kind of frame what the people did together. Uh, and so we, we get a sense that there is this inheritance. Uh, uh, Dr. Haken mentioned the uh, synagogue format. Uh, there was a threefold structure in the synagogue format that kind of came out of their time in Babylon, uh, but it was the sense that put the word central uh, to remember their covenant with the Lord and to remember who they were, whose they were. And so you've got this sense that there was lots of reading of the text, and then there was explication of the text, then there was prayer, and that was the synagogue structure. The New Testament then brings one more element, and that's uh, what uh, Dr. Hakins mentioned, the table. Mm. Uh, the celebration of the Lord's Supper became that fourth element that made it a not just a synagogue Jewish structure, but this is a brand new type of gathering with a brand new emphasis on it. And so uh, it's important to remember th just how much the word was an, an important part. I mean, you've got, as, as he's mentioned, lots of scripture being read and, and, and intentionally too. So you would read the Psalms. You would read from the Old Testament law or the prophets. You would read an, an epistle. And, uh, and of course, the gospel was the high point of the reading. And, and it still is in much of high liturgy today. Hmm. It is interesting that the Lord's table was a, a more of a response to the rest of the service. The Lord's table was kind of meant as a response. And I'm wondering if, do you guys feel that we've, that the way that we celebrate the Lord's table kind of operates that way as a response? Sometimes I wonder if we have that kind of intentionality in our liturgies where, it's framed as a response. Sometimes it often feels like it's just this other thing that now we have to do because Jesus told us to do it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about that. What's the significance of it as response? Uh, if I can point to the scriptural examples, I mean, we look at a, a passage like Exodus 24 and the gathering of the people at Sinai. And when the giving of the law comes, the, they've got their sacrificial meat and there's some rituals with uh, blood being splattered on the people. And they, they actually respond vocally and say, all that you have said, we will obey. 
the next phase of that is the elders go up the mountain and they feast upon the sacrificial meat and then God passes by in, in a theophany. Uh, so we have these elements that it is that gathered meal which in, is the custom of the culture in which law and covenant has been celebrated. Now we sit down together as a covenant people and we sup together. Mm. And so there's this, this aspect of this is the last thing we do together is we celebrate. Uh, I think in modern evangelical churches, sometimes we think of the darkness of the table. We, we, we have to look at the sacrificial part of Jesus. It's totally, uh, that's an important part of the table. But the early church, they would refer to it as Eucharist. And that meant Thanksgiving. That means Thanksgiving in, in Greek. And it was a, a bright celebration. It was a sense of joy. They were celebrating the resurrected Christ and the fact that they were not a people. Now they are a people in many cases. And so, so this is a joyous celebration. And, and that change does, the emphasis changes after Constantine in, in an interesting way because the table begins to look backward. Now that persecution has ended, it's no longer, oh, we can't wait for the eighth day and Christ's return and all this darkness will be dispelled. Now it's not just hope, it's looking backwards and celebrating the sacrifice to remember what God has done for them. And uh, you know, that is an interesting thing that I think that we tend to lose sight of as well. Hmm. Dr. Higgins, something, something interesting that I've noticed in this liturgy that we just both of us talked, you guys both talked about is kind of the lack of singing. Um, what, what about ancient songs? Uh, when did, like, is that just something that is left, didn't come along till later? Or when, when do we start seeing music more in the kind of ancient liturgies? Well, you do have uh, singing in the, in the synagogue worship. I mean, it's the Psalter. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah. again, there is a cycle of singing the Psalter. So the entire Psalter will be sung through in a set period of time. And in the early church, you definitely have, um, in addition to the Psalter as a vehicle for worship, you have the creation of new songs. So, you know, Ephesians chapter five, this is an element of the infilling of the spirit that we sing to one another. Colossians mm -hmm. three um, has the same. And then we even have, and I think I would follow those biblical New Testament scholars who identify uh, uh, kind of uh, early Christian hymns, uh, Philippians two, uh, five through 11. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, uh, 16. And then obviously we have things like, you know, Mary's Magnificat and the, the songs in Revelation, which uh, bespeak the, that the um, Pentecostal, and I use that in the broad sense of the term, experience of the early church, the, the presence of the Spirit has led now to the creation of new songs. Um, probably the earliest uh, kind of collection is the Odes of Solomon. Um, a Syriac Christian, uh, really hymn book of about 42 hymns, um, which um, was written somewhere between 120 and 150. So it's very, very early and gives you some idea of the content of early Christian worship in terms of what they sang about. Um, it has um, uh, some scholars have argued that it was originally a Jewish um, uh, hymn book that was taken over by Christians. It certainly has a flavor similar to the Psalter, but I think embedded, it, it, I think it's written by a Christian because uh, integral to the content is significant references to the Messiah, uh, to Christ, uh, and to the work of Christ, etc. cetera. Hmm. I, I'm wondering, what, what are some other examples? Um, so you've mentioned a few there, the Odes of Solomon. Johnny, are there other examples? Like, do we have access to examples of hymns or creeds that were sung? Now, we had some biblical examples there um, outside of that. One of the pieces that I think got a bit of notoriety uh, in the last decade or so, David Crowder did a version of Fos Hileron, or Hail Gladdening Light, which is an early Christian hymn. Uh, that they've got texts from. And another one that uh, has been reshaped uh, and played uh, by, obviously, you know, in the recording era, is the Oxyrhynchus hymn. It's a village uh, in Egypt where there was a Christian community, and they had a, a dump. And, and things like papyrus fragments, all your old papers, everything went into the dump. And in the 19th century, they were uh, uncovering stuff, and they found this document from somewhere between the 1st to 3rd century. Uh, and it was a, a hymn 
uh, said, let it be silent or let all be silent. Uh, let the luminous stars not shine. Let the winds and all the noisy rivers die down. And as we hymn the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let all the powers add, Amen, Amen. Empire, praise always and glory to God, the sole giver of good things. Amen. Amen. And so there is a snippet uh, up online on YouTube, and I think you might be able to play that for us to give an idea of the kind of instrumentation they've they've tried to recreate the little bell chimes and a little bit of lute kind of stringed instrument in behind it and chanting. So if we can get a chance yeah. to hear a bit of that. Yeah, this is what it sounds like. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, it's it, it really is something to hear. One one of the things I'd point out musically is that you're hearing everybody chanting in unison. The early church uh, wanted the sense of unity when something was sung, and so they discouraged harmony. That, mm. that was something that actually came along later in the medieval period. The incorporation of that that you could have unity in diversity. And, and, and you let beauty begin to shine and, and then it becomes polyphony and all these uh, different arrangements and melodies that would go back and forth, more antiphonal singing. And it, it did become somewhat of uh, an exaggerated thing in the, in the uh, Middle Ages, the 10th, 11th century, when it became uh, the expert only who would knew, know these melodies mm. and these songs. And so they would have choirs appointed to sing them for the people. And of course, you you walk into that Middle Aged period, Middle Ages, pre-Reformation period, where it is everything is a performance from the front. And the yeah. people are just there to observe all the things, even the Lord's table. Mm. But music really served the liturgy. Right now, music is such a central component where we are partaking, we're singing, or in, in some cases, we are just listening to the music in our church services. But music is, in the last 150 to 200 years, a major, major component. Mm. Others talk about recovering the legacy of the Davidic ministry. But music has always been there, and it has served what is done. If you go back to some of the writings of Egeria, this nun who went to Jerusalem in the 4th century for Holy Week, she speaks about the use of music as they went from one station to another. And it wasn't stations of the cross that were just within one building. They literally went to the stations to recreate or to go in the steps of Jesus. And as they went, they would sing a hymn and mm. they would walk and march. And so music served some of the movement of the mm. liturgy. Mm. That's that's interesting. So Dr. Haken, maybe as we kind of try to so we've talked a bit about what we can get a glimpse of from some of this stuff in the, in the past. What might be a lesson that we could distill from this or a, a principle or, you know, something that we can draw out as modern pastors or worship leaders that we could take from the early church? What's maybe an implication that we ought to ponder today, perhaps? Well, I think for me, one of the critical things, uh, two things will come to mind. One is the weekly celebration of the table. Um, I, I, the, you know, I didn't comment on your earlier question regarding, uh, you know, the, the table as response and what we have done to it. Um, it is not response for us normally. I, I don't think the people are thinking of it that way. Mm. Um, because we have limited its celebration to maybe a quarterly celebration, say in Presbyterian circles, your typical, you know, Baptistic world uh, is a monthly celebration. Um, but part of the reason for that is because of the advent of the altar call in the 19th century in revivalist worship. Mm -hmm. So the altar call uh, is done for conversion, but also for people to rededicate their lives. But th th what we've done there is we, all of that has usurped the place of the table. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying the table is a converting ordinance. Mm 
but the, the table has become the place of response. Mm. Sorry, the 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 the, the Lord the, the altar call has become the place of response, yeah. and the table then is off to the side. And I think you see this in 19th century evangelical worship, where the table has a very reduced importance, uh, significantly reduced, uh, because it's it's not it it, it doesn't uh, convert people, and the, the church has become places primarily of conversion. Uh, hmm. conversion centers and we've inherited that and we've lost uh we've lost the the table as a week as a response to the hearing of the word uh, hmm. in other words a rededication of our lives a sense of the presence of christ at the table i'm, I'm i have a very strong calvinistic view of the table in terms of the spiritual presence of the lord um the second thing is the, the more formal aspects that we often identify with say the anglican or catholic or orthodox traditions, uh, we could learn, I think, a great deal from in this sense, is that, again, we've, uh, partly because in the English-speaking tradition, the the Anglican Church in the 17th century weaponized the prayer book. Um, it became uh, a vehicle of state control of uh, churches that dissented from mm. the Anglican structure. And uh, the failure to use the prayer book uh, entirely or partly became a, a punishable offense for about 30 years. And that was probably built to some degree upon the, the Puritan emphasis on the spirit and the freedom of the spirit, so that in our services, we have this um, thought that the use of written prayers and a set liturgy is somehow uh, hindering the work of the spirit. Right. Mm-hmm. And nothing could be further from the truth. Absolutely. In fact, uh, I think it actually frees us um, that regular recitation of similar prayers frees us to explore with those who've gone before, th- who penned these prayers, um, mm-hmm. uh, the, the work of God in ways that we we tend to get in our own ruts anyway. Yeah. And the, the use of written prayers breaks us out of that. And so I think one of the, the second areas, I think that if we, uh, the investigation of liturgy in the early church and then you know, through the Middle Ages and the Reformation period, uh, I think one of the things that we need to recover, really re- recover, is the use of um, not not completely dispensing with extemporaneous prayer, but uh, a structure that uh, accords more with this 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 long period of, of worship. It was interesting. I, I think it was um, Justin Martyr who mentioned early on that if you are a skilled prayer, you may actually introduce some extemporaneous prayer, but they encouraged people to stay to the written prayers. And there was a a sense that the church, in a time of battling heresy, really wanted to use Mm. the liturgy and worship to enforce doctrine, to train people, to to really root it in them. And and St. Prosper of Aquitaine came up with this phrase in, the I think, the 4th or 5th century, uh, lex orandi, lex credendi, uh, the law of prayer shapes the law of belief. And of course, it works both ways, because you shape your prayers by what you believe, but nonetheless, those of us who have spent a long time in our lives praying something like the Lord's Prayer, when you walk through it, you begin to see that there's some tremendous aspects of teaching just in that prayer alone. So what, what is it that we can do as worship leaders in this day and age to recapture that same sense of discipleship, that it's not just a, a grand celebration, a time for me to, you know, voice my feelings to God and, and revel in, in these things. I mean, it's great to celebrate and to give thanks too. But there was an intentionality in discipling the believers who gathered together. And, 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 and in the same sense that they didn't even have the scriptures to read. I, even though we do today, how many believers read the scriptures daily? And so if we can at least read good portions of Scripture and show that our, that our faith is built around this communication from God to His people, I think we can recapture some of the intentionality of the early fathers. Mm. I'm wondering what encouragement um, you both would give a young worship leader. He's in a church and he wants to start, you know, learning a bit from this and, and taking some steps forward. What might... What might you suggest, um, Michael, I'll start with you. What might you suggest to a young worship leader who wants to grow in his ability to lead worship, maybe in a way that's a little more 
uh, yeah, reflective of the early church. What, what, what would you say to them? Well, I think probably two things. One is uh, it might be helpful, uh, depending upon where they're at, um, to take some courses in the history of uh, worship and liturgy. Mm-hmm. Um, so get a sense of how churches have worshipped in the past um, and to be able to glean material from that to structure worship today. The second thing, I think, is to, to get a book like the Book of Common Prayer, which is probably the easiest access mm-hmm. to uh, a more formal liturgy, um, and begin to use that in his own private devotional life and see mm-hmm. its benefit there, mm-hmm. and then maybe incorporate some of that into the, into, uh, uh, the, the leading of worship uh, in his local church. Um, without adopting the entire structure, uh, I think there is there is uh, um, certainly much benefit. It mm-hmm. doesn't have to be the Book of Common Prayer. The one, that's the one that comes most readily to mind. What uh, Thomas Cramner, who was the architect of that, did, he went back and he um, revised uh, various prayer books that had been used during the medieval period, but he went back to the early church um, to, to glean inspiration for how to structure worship. And some of the prayers that he uses, particularly in the collects, uh, these are short prayers that have a, a very clear structure yeah. of usually four or five distinct elements. Some of these go all the way back to the third century. Yeah. So mm-hmm. in praying mm-hmm. these prayers, we're praying with the people of God that goes yeah. back nearly 2,000 years. Wow. It's tremendous. Yeah. Johnny, what might you suggest or, you know, say to that young worship leader? How would you equip them? I I endorse all of that. Uh, There is just a sense that we can learn from those who have gone before us. And we need to take our gaze back, you know, further than we think, because we we presume that worship originated with the revivalist period, you know, and even if you were generous and said it, well, it originated with the hymn writers like the Wesleys or Isaac Watts, you know, but there is so much to be gained from examining a bigger picture of what worship is in terms of when the church gathers beyond the music. When we as musical worship leaders can get acquainted with the use of scripture, the use of prayers, be they collects or other things, the use of the benediction, what is the role that it plays, understanding how every formal or formal our liturgy is informs us how we are to put those services together when that is placed that responsibility is placed on us don't fear it and uh even though we're history geeks there's lots of good stuff in there (laughs) brothers thank you so much uh both of you for being on this episode what would you have a resource that you could send somebody to a good book um, where if they wanted to learn more in the early church, you would you would suggest this? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think the primary sources, uh, just a martyrist apology. Um, Tertullian, uh, in some of his works, also has some material that relates to worship. The Odes of Solomon, um, that is available in a number of modern translations. And then a few years ago, uh, Erdmans did a series of books on worship um, in, in various historic settings. And um, this is one um, where uh, where G- the walking where Jesus walked worship in fourth century Jerusalem, hmm. and it deals with uh, the architecture. It deals uh, with the, the physical architecture. It is. It deals with uh, components of the liturgy, the theology, and so on. And uh, you're suddenly now plunged into, and they use Cyril of Jerusalem as their kind of main backdrop. And Agira, who um, uh, was mentioned earlier, um, you're you're really now plunged into that world in all of its as much as we can tell from archaeology and text, all of its richness. Mm. And um, they're, they're very helpful resources. They've they've done ones all the way through. I think there's one, for instance, in um, you know an African American uh, church in this in the 20th century, hmm. um, a Reformation congregation. And so they're very, very, they were a unique set of studies. I'd never really seen anything like it. Uh, there were about, um, probably about a, half a dozen uh, that yeah. came out uh, at the time. Okay, that's great. I know one book for me that 
kind of Brian Chappell's Christ-centered worship, he kind of traces some history of liturgy um, kind of more later, but I think that's helpful. Johnny, what would be a resource that, or a few resources that you'd like to, you know, you'd send people to? Yeah, um, there's a couple of uh, books that have been uh, written in the last few years, particularly about ancient spirituality and Christian worship. Ancient Christian worship by Andrew McGowan goes into the details of what the people did in that period of time. What were the prayers like? What was the table like? What was baptism like? So, you know, it's it's that early Christian period. Another one is Praying and Believing in the Early in Early Christianity by Maxwell Johnson, who's a, a scholar, historic historian mm-hmm. scholar. Uh, a, a more recent look at some history, which might feel a little closer to home, is the influence of the history or the influence of the praise and worship movement, and uh, an excellent resource by Dr. Lester Ruth and Lim Sui Hong called The History of the Praise and Worship Movement, which tracks it from about the 1940s up to the present time and shows the influence of that movement on across denominations in, mm-hmm. in the Pentecostal church, uh, sorry, okay. in the Protestant church. That's great. Well, again, thank you both Dr. Markin and Dr. Hagen. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much for joining us for and listeners. Time. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you on the next episode. We pray this is a blessing and God bless you. We'll see you next time. Worship God is a production of the gospel coalition, Canada. For more Christ-exalting resources, go to ca.thegospelcoalition.org.